What I want to do is kind of take you on a quick tour of what's going on in the U.S. economy, global economy, U.S. financial markets, uh, issues in financial services, issues in education. We'll try to have some fun at the same time. This is, after all, the dismal science of economics. How would you like to wake up every morning and go to work in the dismal science? Uh, we'll try to have some fun. Uh, let me have you ponder one thought, if I can, over the next little while. If a man speaks in the forest with no woman there to hear him, is he still wrong? So ponder that thought, ponder that thought for the next little while. <laughs> the economy that we are part of, the economy our children, our grandchildren will become participants in, is one that demands and rewards education more than ever before. I'm an economist. I'm going to give you all kinds of numbers in 45, 50 minutes. The next two numbers I give you are the most powerful numbers I will give you today. If your kids or grandkids need a reason to justify post-high school education, in this case, college or university life, tell them this. Tell them that in 1980, the average college graduate in this country made 25% more than the average high school graduate. 1980, 25% more. That number today is 90% more. The key to financial success for many people in this country used to be affiliating with unions, but a key to financial success for many more people in the future is education. I mentioned kids and grandkids. I have 10 grandkids. I agree with many of you a statement by Gorbadal who said, if I would have known grandkids were this great, I would have had them first. <laughs> There's also a flip side to that that goes like this. I have seen the lights of Paris. I have seen the lights of Rome. But the greatest sight I've ever seen is the grandkids' tail lights driving home. <laughs> if you're not there yet, that'll make some sense later on. For our young people, we traditionally gave them two options. One was to finish high school and get a job. One was to finish high school, go to a traditional two-year or four-year college or university. Well, the marketplace says, wait a minute, things are changing, the economy is evolving, becoming more technologically sophisticated. There is, of course, a third viable alternative, which is the increasing relevance and value and rewards of applied technology education, or what we used to call vocational training. Think of some of the traditional blue-collar occupations in our economy, like working on an auto assembly line. The people on an auto assembly line who used to do the same, the same routine or mundane tasks for eight or ten hours a day, in many cases today, these people run the computers. These people run the robotics that provide much of the physical labor. They need the constant technological updates to be effective, to be successful in their chosen occupations. We still think of colleges and universities as a place where you find 18, 19, 20-year-olds, 20 22-year-olds, 20 25-year-olds, and a few older. But in America's colleges and universities today, one out of every three students is 40 years old and older. The mix is changing, and it's changing in a dramatic way. But as we talk to our kids about post-high school education, in this case, college or university life, we say as parents or grandparents, take this seriously. Recognize how important this is to your financial future. But many times we forget to say, while you're there, have some fun. I think back to my own undergraduate days many, many, many years ago. My buddies and I spent about 90% of our money on women and partying. The other 10% we just wasted. You were phenomenal. All three of your presentations at the recent Industrial Asset Management Council Professional Forum placed in the top five ranking. Not only were you the highest rated speaker, you hold the second and third place ratings as well. Industrial Asset Management Council. Let's face it, there just aren't that many people who can make an hour of economics interesting, much less fun. You manage to do both time and time again for our audiences. During the nine programs on which you have spoken, you have been nothing less than professional, insightful, informative, and amusing. Consumer Bankers Association. 
Congratulations on a brilliant reception from our annual PATH conference audience. You did a great job of informing and entertaining people. Trust me, that has never been said of an economist at our conference before. You and your incredible staff made my work a pleasure. IPS Sendero. And the fourth reason to keep inflation pressures under control, this little thing called the Internet itself. Thank God for its inventor. <laughs> Al Gore. <laughs> Al Gore denies ever having said the in he invented the Internet. There is some evidence that he did. Uh, more importantly, he received a couple of legislative awards in recent years for his initial legislative contributions to help allow the Internet to be what it has become. Estimates suggest over the next three years, global companies will save in excess of one and a quarter trillion dollars in operating costs using the Internet to reduce the costs of doing business. Inflation pressures will stay under control. By the way, it may or may not be true that Al Gore is about to open a school of dance known as Al Gore Rhythm. I made that up myself. <laughs> 12, 14 years ago, the U.S. economy was a bloated dinosaur. 12, 14 years ago, we collectively produced a modest quality good. We were selling it to the world at a high price, basically getting our butts kicked by the Germans and the Japanese in particular. Then we went through this whole process of downsizing and right-sizing. Some cases, capsizing and dump-sizing. <laughs> but what emerged from that whole process is what has been in recent years one of the most powerful innovative, flexible, dynamic, imaginative economies in the world. U.S. role of dominance in the global economy the last 10 years has been as clear-cut as at any time since World War II. As economists, we try to look over the horizon, what are the critical industries of today and tomorrow, how are we positioned for them? Right now, I'd like to suggest seven critical industries of the future. Technology, transportation, telecommunications, financial services, energy, entertainment, and biomedicine. Those seven critical industries of the future, in one way or another, find the U.S. in a major position. Uh, by show of hands.